The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. You are back in the House of Mystery, and I'm Al Warren, and uh, today we've got a full house, and everyone's wearing a mask, not on their face, but they're wearing a mask. So we've, <laughs> we've got the co-host, Mr. David North Martino, sitting there, and he's uh, ready to record. So how's it going, David? I'm very well. How are you, Al? I'm, you know, it's been a, it's been, I've had better weeks. We know. <laughs> yeah. We know what's going on. But I think it's uh, been crazy for everybody all around. Yeah, 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 and I got I got over the sickness that I had from L.A., that beautiful town. Mm. Um, for my L.A. listeners, I love it. Um, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> and of course, uh, Mr. John Copenhaver back from the um, Agatha Christie's. <laughs> no, from the Agatha. Oh. <laughs> yeah, the Ma- Malice Domestic uh, Convention and outside of Bethesda, it was uh, fun and uh, and exhausting. I was surprised. I, I, I didn't, I, you know, of course, I, you were there and everything, so making it hobnobbing with the big guys. But some of our, uh, Alan Ornoff <laughs> won us great. I, I love him. I absolutely love that guy. Alan's great. Yeah. Alan's great. Good guy. Really good and a great writer. Yeah, I just, why do they call it domestic? It's, Malice is really, uh, I mean, it, 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 it de, de, it's defined sort of as traditional mysteries. It includes a lot of cozies. Um, it's like not a place where you go with true crime or noir. Um, I'm barely kind of acceptable in, in the sense that I write, <laughs> I write, you know, somewhat traditional mysteries with a dark edge, but I think if I pushed it any further, they'd be kind of like, mm, you know, um, I know they're trying to sort of rebrand a little bit to be more truly just traditional mystery. Um, and not just like a cozy conference. Um, yeah. But, uh, but it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it, I think that's kind of where it comes from, though, is sort of the, the lighter side of uh, crime fiction. Um, it's also very close, so, it, you know, it's, it tends to be, draw a lot of D.C. Uh, uh, crime writers and Maryland crime writers and that kind of thing. Yeah, and you're, you're popular. Everyone loves you, so you're there. <laughs> well, I try. I try to please the people. You're <laughs> flying around the room, shaking hands and <laughs> kissing babies and all that stuff. They all, oh, yeah, yeah, all the baby kisses. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, speaking of baby kisses, we've got a very young author here, very new author. Um, so he's going to join us today, and we're going to talk to him about his <laughs> new book that's just out. So, And actually, it's, I like the title. It's called Desert Getaway, and the author, of course, is Michael Kraft. So thank you for sitting in with us today. It's my pleasure entirely. And uh, just to clarify, I'm no baby. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you, 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 you certainly you look like such a young man. So, oh, you know. well, that, that goes a long way on radio, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's how we do it. But you see, this is it. You know, you charm the guest and then go in mm. for the kill. So here we go. Um, wow. So this is great. Um, how, do you, I guess you probably feel a lot of pressure um, when you've got a new book coming out, or do you? Or are you, are you the type that it doesn't bother at all? You don't? It's nothing. Or, Pressure? Yeah. <laughs> Me? <laughs> yes. It, 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 there's obviously a, a certain amount of stress uh, that, that goes with uh, the launch of any new book, especially when the book is the launch of a new series and a new publisher and all of that. Uh, I've been through it before, um, but uh, it never gets old. And it never gets easier in, in terms of the, uh, the the stress angle, but uh, I'm you know delighted to say we made it. You know, it's uh, it's it's in print, it's official, and uh, I couldn't be more happy about it. When you go to write a book like that, I I, I wonder at your point of your writing career because you've written quite a few books. Do you have this all sort of formed in your mind? Of, of where you want it to go and and what you hope people take away from the book? Well, I, I think every author has you know their secret wish list of what they hope uh, people are going to take away from the book. Uh, like, you know, it's the great American novel, it's the best thing he's ever written, and so on and so forth. And also, you know, it should have a certain 
a message to the story and all of all of the, those good thematic things that make it more than just mere entertainment. But I, I sense, Alan, that your, your question also had to do with my approach to writing the book uh, when when you when you asked if uh, if I knew how, how it would turn out. Is is that what you meant? Like. Am I a planner, an outliner? <laughs> sort of, sort of. Like sometimes, because I've talked to writers that they, they sort of have this vision of, of an, an idea for a book, and they start putting it, they start writing it. You know, they might have a line, they might have a, just a, a paragraph, yes, just this idea, and then they start to, to ponder what they want to do. And, and I just wonder if you are, are you the type that kind of knows how do I say this, like a painting, like you know what you want that painting to look like at the end. You don't know how you're going to get there, but you kind of have an idea of that image. And are you wanting it, that image to be what people get? Like, do you know what I mean? Like there's a kind of yes. a forethought into, okay, I want of course. It to be this. Yeah, and I, I know, you know, there's, uh, there's sort of a, a wide divide among fiction writers, you know, as to whether they are plotters or pantsers, you know, the, who write by the seat of their pants. And I'm, I'm very much a plotter, an outliner. I, it's, it's just the way I'm built. Uh, yeah, I, that's how I tick. Um, I like to have control over a project, and I, I you know, thoroughly plan it, research it, I outline it in terms of a chapter-by-chapter chapter narrative outline, so that by the time I'm ready to actually sit down, and commit, say, 100,000 words to paper, um, I, I know where it's going. Now, obviously, anywhere along that process, inspiration can strike, and you can have a better idea and, uh, you know, and freely revise. Boy, word processing is, uh, you know, a miracle gift to writers. My, my first couple of novels were written on legal pads and then transcribed to typewriter by typewriter, uh, and you know every revision meant retyping the whole novel. So I mean th those days are gone. Revision's easy. It's easy to rethink. And uh, as as one great writer, I forget the name, once said, "Great novels aren't written; they're rewritten." Uh, but I I still can't help but feeling that the more amount of planning you do up front. Uh, the easier and more productive that process is going to be. Uh, mysteries, by their nature, tend to be plot centric, and I know that's another that's another great debate among fiction writers. Uh, you know, the the the, the plot centric novel or the uh, the character driven novel, and I mean the answer should be obvious. Both of those. Uh, factors are absolutely necessary uh, to writing a, a good, compelling story. But in, in the case of a mystery, a conventional murder mystery, and which, which, which mine tend to be, um, you know, it's a whodunit, it's a puzzle. And you have so many suspects, and you have so many possible motives and all that. So there are a lot of interlinking details. And to my way of mind, uh, that uh, you know, those those givens up front just make that sort of project especially applicable to planning and outlining. I mean, I, I keep detailed character lists. Um, I, I keep a detailed timeline, and you know, as I'm writing, I follow that. You know, and I, I and once I get to the point where. I'm actually drafting the novel, committing those 80,000 words or 100,000 words or more to paper. Uh, I, I never find myself stuck in a, like, what's next? What happens next? Sense. I always know what's next. Yes, I know how the novel ends before I start writing it. Um, and, you know, as, as you mentioned while articulating the question, you know, some writers are struck by a line or a character or maybe in my case a poison or a particular title that provides a nut inspiration for what that book is about. But, uh, and, and that is, that's a highly valuable commodity, that nut, that inspiration. Um, you, any, I think any writer would agree you don't want to waste those. And uh, I'm, I'm going to go off on a tangent here. 
uh, the idea is short stories versus novels. Um, I, when I was a kid, I, you know, I, I guess I always harbored this dream of being a published novelist. So it was always the novel that appealed to me as a, as a, a goal that I thought I wanted to commit myself to. And after having written several of them, uh, Desert Getaway is my 18th published novel. Um, a after, after writing several of them, I came to find that the notion of the nut of it, the germ of it, what's it about in just less than a sentence, uh, is, is so valuable that it, it, it kind of ingrained in me an aversion to short fiction, uh, short stories. Uh, and I, I came to think of them as just exercises that uh, writers go through. Uh, because, I mean, coming up with a truly original short story is in its creative stages every bit as challenging and every bit as draining as coming up with creative idea, the germ for a novel. It involves characters, setting, conflict, resolution, and so forth. Um, that changed uh, when I decided at the ripe old age of 50-something to go back to school and pursue an MFA, Master of Fine Arts, in creative writing, where the short story is, of course, a, uh, you know, a, not only a valuable teaching tool and not only a valuable exercise, but it's a, it's a nice bite-sized chunk that you can uh, discuss in workshop groups and so on. And during the course of that graduate program, I, I became aware of what was at the time sort of an emerging newish medium for short stories, and, and that is uh, the, the novel in stories, or in other words, a collection of linked short stories. And the, you know, the basic characteristic of that is that it's, uh, it's a collection of short stories, say a dozen, but they do have linking characters or linking themes or whatever, so that as you as you read the volume of these twelve short stories, uh, they they tell a larger story in and of themselves, like like a novel would. So each of the uh, each of the short stories in in the collection functions sort of like chapters of a novel, except that chapters of a novel cannot stand alone. They have to be. They have to be read all of them, and they have to be read in the order they're presented. Whereas in uh, in a novel in stories or a collection of linked stories, each of the stories can stand alone, and that's the beauty of it. Just to wrap this up, these thoughts on short stories. Uh, I got a an, an email out of the blue. This goes back almost three years ago uh, from. Barbara DeMarco Barrett, who is approaching me wondering if I'd be interested in contributing, what, a short story to an anthology she was proposing to edit titled Palm Springs Noir. And there's a series of these titled Palm Springs Noir. This was to be published by Akashic Books in, in New York, who are known for a, a lengthy a series of city noir anthologies. There's Boston noir, Los Angeles noir, Chicago noir, etc. And Barbara was uh, in the early stages of putting together uh, the Palm Springs noir anthology, which did in fact come out last uh, July. So it's it's going on, you know, nine months old now that it, that it was actually published. And uh, I was recommended by Todd Goldberg. Uh, to to participate in this anthology, and my first reaction was, "Gee, I really haven't written noir, but uh, it's just a short story, so heck, why not try it? You know, just jump right in." And I found that I loved it, and it it did as as any story. Uh, it did require me to just really think out of the box, come up with totally new characters, totally new situation. And the bottom line is, I found that I loved my two main characters, Dante O'Donnell and Jazz Friendly, who are, on the surface, polar opposites. 
he is a white gay man, and she is a black straight woman who happens to be an ex Palm Springs cop. And so, you know, at, at first blush, these people are polar opposites. They start out as antagonists, and during the course of of the story, which okay, I, I, I need to explain that short story became the basis of the present novel. That's its title, Desert Getaway. Um, the short story was titled VIP Check-In. So uh, basically the short story became chapter one of the novel. In the course of the novel, these two antagonists become not best of friends, but they, they do both change in that they come to not only respect each other, but uh, come to understand and feel um, a measure of affection for each other. So, I mean, I, I think their, their relationship, which starts out very much on the rocks, has a, has a really nice growth arc uh, through the course of the novel, and uh, it also gives the setup uh, for them uh, returning and uh, solving future crimes. Well, how do you experience your characters? Uh, do you have an inner monologue in your head when you're, when you're writing the dialogue, or... Is it more, uh, do you experience it more as like images and symbols uh, as, you're, as you're creating the prose? Well, I, I, love, I love setting and description, so that's, I, I guess I have a very theatrical mind that way. Um, so, yes, I, and also I have a visual mind. I, my, my college background is in graphic design, uh, so I, I, I love the visual aspects of storytelling. But, because... Most of my more recent fiction has been uh, has has featured first person narrators. Um, it's it's extremely important, obviously, that I, as the writer, hear that voice. And you know, people always ask me, "Well, is that character you? Is Dante you?" And my my stock answer is that sure, there's a bit of me in every character I write, but no one character is me. Um, it's safe to assume um, that if you're writing a first-person narrator, though, uh, you know, if you're in that person's head every word of the book and that person has to be present for every scene in the book in order to tell the story, um, yes, I'm, either that, I'm, I'm kind of listening to myself or listening to myself as an alter ego. Now, it's kind of interesting, though. In this case, the second most important character in the book is a black woman, um, obviously, I don't have that life experience, um, but I mean, every writer, every fiction writer uh, needs to stretch at times and bring people into the universe of the story um, that is, is not, you know, pulled directly from their own experience. So let's just say that when it came to the character of Jazz Friendly, who is not very friendly, the, the her name is almost a joke. I had to do a lot of channeling of my inner Viola Davis. Well, Michael, you have written across many sort of subgenres in. <laughs> yeah, including cats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? Exactly. <laughs> Tell us about like your journey through those different. Um, Genre, like what, what, what's your progression to things that are a bit more gritty and, and darker to lighter, not unserious, but lighter in tone? Well, you know, I've, I've found throughout the time I've been writing, which I hate to refer to as my career, that, that, that sounds kind of, kind of pretentious. But I, I mean, I have found, <laughs> <laughs> I, I have found that as the years have passed, uh, my books have contained more and more humor. I don't consider myself a comedian, but I, I do, you know, I, I can't seem to tell a story without cracking a joke. And for, for instance, my, my first seven novels were the Mark Manning series, and they were pretty heavy. And it, I really, you know, I was finding my voice as I wrote those. In fact, in fact the first three uh, three installments of the Mark Manning series, which started in in the late 90s, um, they all have different narrative styles, and it it took me a while to you know to to find my voice for that series, but also in the larger sense to find my voice as an author. 
And I was continually injecting uh, more humor into the stories I told. And then that, that series just sort of ran its course. I thought it was time to put it to bed after seven installments. Um, I tried... Uh, I tried another series, the Claire Gray series, uh, which happened to be set in Palm Springs while I was still living in Wisconsin. And that had a lot more humor in it. Uh, but by, by its nature, I had limited that uh, to four books from its inception. It was, it was meant to be, you know, those four volumes. And then I did a lot of thrashing, for lack of a better word. It was, you know, that's when I went back to school got the MFA, thought about what's next, wrote a couple of standalones, then did a novel in stories, Inside Dumont, uh, which uh, provided for me a lot of creative, fertile ground that I thought was ripe for development. And looking for what I would truly commit myself to next, I recalled a conversation that I had had with my agent years ago. We've been together I think 25 years now, more than 20 years. And at one point he said, you know, you like cats. Have you ever considered cats? There are cat mysteries. And I said, what? Yeah, there are a <laughs> number. He said, oh, yeah, it's a venerable old subgenre. You might want to look into those. And uh, I, I just, I, I would just, so I would, would go to Amazon and pull up cat mysteries, and I'd see these covers, these cutesy covers, you know, but, you know, teapots and stuff, and I thought, ah, I'm not going there. But, uh, you know, after, after writing Inside Dumont and having come up with a bunch of characters there, I did, <laughs> I did find the inspiration to try a cat story, not a cat novel, but just a cat story featuring one of the characters from that book. Uh, and it was a contest entry, and it won first place. And the title of that, that single story was Mr. Puss. And so uh, that became the, the generation, the, or the inspiration, uh, for my series of <laughs> Mr. Puss mysteries. They're really cute. They're really fun. I'm very proud of them. Um, but, you know, I, I was... I, I turned out three on a yearly basis, and then I thought, you know what? You know, I'm, I'm getting, uh, I'm, I'm getting on in years now, and I really don't want to go to my grave. <laughs> no, known as a cat mystery writer. So I thought it really is time to change directions again, and uh, and then you know the offer uh, for the Palm Springs Noir anthology came across my desk just at the right moment. It was, it was the perfect shift of gears uh, that led me to the current series being launched, Dante and Jazz. It's, uh, there are no cats in it. In fact, there's a nasty little dog, <laughs> but he doesn't talk. I think Dave is our cat lady. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I certainly am. Um, well, that's, it, it's, it's an interesting process, the whole thing. So when you, when you were doing, like you said, part of a series now, do you have kind of an idea of where you want your characters to be three or four books down the road, or is this just, is it like episodic for you? You're just doing as it comes. Um, it's, it's a bit of both, Alan. Uh, but yet yeah, your, your, your first question, do I have a sense of the overall arc of the series? Yes. I mean, I, uh, I, I do, I do have a sense of where those character driven subplots that are, are contained in the novel, where those are headed. Uh, where, whereas each individual installment in the series is, is kind of the standalone whodunit. Um, the, the whodunit, the, the murder in, in, in the case of Desert Getaway, there are multiple murders, but those are all self-contained in the story and will not uh, be continued in any sense in other, uh, in other episodes or installments of the series. But uh, the series itself, the two main characters, Dante and Jazz, they will evolve and evolve together in different ways you know, over the course of the series that I already have in mind. You write 
um, about Palm Springs and Desert Getaway. I know you live there. In fact, there's quite a few um, gay crime writers living, uh, or at least having homes in Palm Springs. Is there something particularly noir about Palm Springs? Well, talk a little about the location. Um, the, I think the Palm Springs location is just wonderful for uh you know for a novelist and particularly for a mystery writer it has such an overwhelming natural beauty uh any of you who have visited here know it is you know it's located in the coachella valley uh it is a valley it is ringed by mountains you can turn around 360 degrees and to the extent that your view is uh, unobstructed, you will see mountains. And it's, it's just a lush desert oasis. Um, and you know, the, the first thing people will tell you about Palm Springs in the entire area is, it, well, it's hot. But beyond hot, it's beautiful. And, you know, and there's a lot of pride of ownership in homes and the cities try to outdo each other in terms of, you know, landscaping their medians and, and, and all that. It's just a beautiful place to be. So in a sense, you know, it, it becomes, uh, it, it sets up instantly um, the, the prospect for conflict when things go wrong, and things go wrong everywhere, but it, it seems particularly disturbing here. Um, also, when you think about the desert, it's not just cactus flowers, it is cactus, and it is serpents, and, uh, you know, there, there's kind of a nasty edge to things that, uh, you know, any writer would want to explore. Um, so, it, it's, it's, it's very, it's very handy, uh, I, I think, as a, as a, as a mystery writer to have a, a setting available to me that I not only know very well, uh, but it, it allows itself to almost poetic description, but it also uh, lends itself toward amazing contrasts of uh, times and incidents, incidents where things just don't go right. How do you get into the minds of the characters that you don't relate to? I know you, you say you, you, know, you dug deep for... Uh, Viola Davis and stuff like that, but how do you make it sound realistic? So like when you're using um, a character, like a, a female or somebody that's completely opposite of you, wh where do you draw from to get that um, feeling so that it reads true? Well, the bottom line is we're all human. And, you know, we're all affected by different circumstances and different backgrounds and at times different skin colors and at times different sexual orientations, but we're all human. Uh, we all suffer from time to time, and we're all, we hope, very happy from time to time. So, I mean, there, there's a spectrum of emotions and a, a spectrum of challenges that, uh, that every character has the potential of facing. Um, the rest, I just make up. That's what fiction writers do. It, after the process of writing a book, like when you completed this book and you look back at it, um, and when you're going to start the second book, do you find that um, there's a change that took place just from the experience of writing that book? Yes, absolutely. I mean, it, it's not only the relief of typing the end <laughs> at the end of it, but... Uh, it, it, it's impossible to have been in characters' heads for that length of time. You know, that number of pages, that number of words, and that number of months or years, in some cases, that it took you to commit those words to paper. Uh, there, there's just no way that you can make that journey with your characters and uh, not learn something from them, which is sort of an amazing part of the creative process. You know, you think you're in control. You think you're God. Um, you think you're, you know, this is your story to tell. And by the time you're finished, you realize that these characters that have been invented out of thin air have taught you something. And, uh, and I, I'm sure, uh, I'm sure any fiction writer would say, yeah, that's, that's one of, one of those unsung rewards that you don't even think about going into. 
but uh, you're very much rewarded rewarded by coming out of it. Well, you mentioned uh, having an MFA in creative writing, and I'm just wondering if you think uh, your MFA has changed your approach to writing mystery fiction. I went back to school at a time when I already had probably a dozen published novels, and a lot of people wondered why I did it, and was it worth it? Um, I did it because I personally felt the need to recharge and to step back from what I had been doing and to find a new direction if I ultimately decided that I needed one. But in, in the course of those very intensive two years of doing nothing but reading and writing and talking with other writers and critiquing each other, um, I, I must say, it was it was a transformative experience for me. Now, maybe I just like school. I was always a good student, <laughs> and, you know, I hung around at college long after I was finished with it, and it was just great to be back in that academic atmosphere. You know, that appeals very highly to me. Other people may not care for that at all, but I, I enjoyed the experience, and I know that it helped me become a better writer. Um, during much of my, uh, you know, day job career, I, I functioned as an editor of a of a corporate magazine, and I thought at, at the time I I had a, a similar revelation, and that was that editing other people's work really helped me with my own writing because I could see pitfalls common pitfalls among other among other writers that you know it was, it was that were so much easier to identify in other writing than in mine um, and then in uh, during during the MFA when we weren't just you know copy editing each other's work we were really critiquing it at a at a you know, at a base level you know does this story work you know character development arc arc plot arcs and so on, um, spotting flaws in other students' writing certainly, you know, enlightened those same flaws in my own. Uh, so, yes, it was, it was highly advantageous to me. Does all that make you ever go back and um, want to change some of your earlier work? No, never. Um, you know, w once it's published, it's published, it's finished. I have no desire uh, to go back and rethink any of those. Um, you know, which is not to say that I think they're perfect and they can't be changed and they couldn't be better. That's not the case at all. I just I look at earlier work as earlier work, um, and it, it's published and it is what it is. Uh, but you know, the lessons I've learned along the way will be applied to the next novel, not those. <laughs> um it's just circling back a little bit to uh, when we were mentioning uh, Malice, this uh, conference that I went to uh, earlier, uh, or just over this weekend. And, um, you know, one of the things that is really true is that this sort of lighter, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, cozy genre, although I think cozy can mean some very specific thing to some people and a broader thing to others. But one thing that I kept on saying was a lot of sort of diversity coming up in that genre that hasn't been there mm -hmm. before. So you see a lot of people of color, um, you know, writing cozies um, and sort of tying in their particular sort of cultural backgrounds. And, you know, I know that Desert Getaway is sort of a noir and a lighter side of noir, but you also have done these cozies that, you know, I've read as well. And I'm just curious, like, do you see – um, the genre sort of shifting in an interesting way. I mean, where are you oh, I mean, that? cozy is is a, an interesting title for that, that subgenre, and it it doesn't get a lot of respect among you know intellectual writers. I mean, you know that that's just genre fiction, pure and simple, as far as many people are concerned. But I, I think cozies often get short shrift uh, in in the whole scheme of things, um, and. Cozies are defined in various ways. For instance, uh, very little violence, no sex. Um, and, like, I, you know, I abhor violence, but uh, all my novels have sex. <laughs> but, but, I mean, I, I would, you know, 
a more generalized definition for me of the cozy is that the uh, protagonist is an amateur sleuth. I mean, if, if you were really dealing with a detective or a cop, that's something else. Um, uh, cozies tend to be, you know, the librarian next door or, um, you know, what's her name on murder she wrote. I mean, and, and much of Agatha Christie. Um, you know, falls into the cozy category. But uh, I, I think really any, uh, any book that deals primarily with an amateur sleuth, someone who happens to be good at this, but someone else does the police work, that, to, my, to my way of thinking, that's a cozy. So, you know, given that Desert Getaway very much has noir roots, that the noirness of the novel is pretty much restricted to chapters one, maybe two, um, but the, the novel as a whole, I would definitely classify as a cozy, an erotic cozy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, just, it seems like the genre is, is, you know, whenever we label something, um, and, you know, people have very different definitions of what cozy means, it usually does have to do with limitation of violence and a kind of closed setting and yeah. that kind of thing. Um, and, and, you know, there are these tropes that pop up like cats, you know, uh -huh. that kind of thing. But um, but they seem to be, you know, they seem to be sort of pushing at those boundaries a little bit. Perhaps other other genres are, too, um, or even mixing it up. Yeah. Like you're saying with Desert Way of yeah. Noir and the, um, uh, the cozy sort of, or the lighter elements as well. I mean, there, there, um, it does... I. I mean, I agree. It is getting it's getting mixed up in a good way. I mean, it's just becoming a right. you know. Yeah. It's a bad thing. The the only kind of drawback to that is it's sometimes hard to identify your audience when you're doing that. Uh, you know, when I'm writing cat mysteries, you know that that uh, that has a particular audience. Not that not that gay readers can't appreciate them because many gay men like cats, um, but. Uh, then, you know, a, a more erotic, uh, hard-boiled uh, sort of gay mystery, you know, you're, you're not going to market that to the same person you're marketing a cat mystery to. And also, in a bookstore, you know, where do you shelve that? For better or worse, uh, that's not the consideration that it used to be, because there just aren't as many bookstores as, as there used to be. Um, but that's a broader topic. Do you have a subtext or a meaning underlying the story itself that you want people to get? Oh. I mean, sometimes that happens even without, sometimes people plan it. You know, some writers will have an intention yes. in their mind of some point they want to get across, but sometimes it happens naturally and you don't realize it until the book's done. I think, I think all of my books uh, do have an underlying message or theme, um, and in in some more than in others, but it's always there. And, and stated very succinctly, that that theme or message that I hope the reader gets is think for yourself. Uh, you know, don't rely on what other people tell you. Don't believe in things that people simply tell you you must believe. Think for yourself. Um, you know, that can have, that can have big time implications about religion and so on. Or it can just, it can be as, as cozy and condensed as deductive reasoning. Um, but that, that, that is something that I think if you look closely, you will find permeates everything I write. Does it bother you, or do you like to interact with people on uh, social media and, and also on websites where they review some of your work? And do you sort of, does it bother you if someone says or does something that, you, that, that you know, they don't like it or they say things? Does that, how, how do you act and react with uh, on, the online community? Well, I, I, I've basically used the online community to promote my work. Um, and people who like what I write tend to be friendly. <laughs> and people who don't like what I write just tend to ignore me. Um, I, you know, I, I can't say that I've ever felt attacked by someone who, who didn't enjoy what I wrote. Well, we can work on that. 
No, that's all right. We'll work on that. We'll get. Well, please, everyone, send in some sort of a. An Just leave it there. Yes. And, you know, it's it's a good experience to have. It really. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, we we've you know, we're we're all of an age where we remember when online did not exist. You know, and then. Uh, in an in an age that seems so much driven by social media, uh, I, I think I think anyone who wants to keep their wits about them, you know, will will keep a certain distance from it, and have a certain and, and develop a certain thickness of skin when it comes to that, because you know, online uh, the internet, I mean, it's just crazy out there, um, and you can't engage beyond a point. Um, you can disagree, but why engage with uh, with nut jobs? <laughs> <laughs> I make friends of them, um, but you know. But I, I'm only 18. What are you saying? I'm 18 with 42 years of experience at being 18. Okay, uh, oh, that's terrible. I know. Um, well, that's uh, it's great. Now, if you had if you had one book, if someone had never heard of you before, which I find hard to believe, but they've never heard oh, well, of my believe book. me, they're out there. You know. <laughs> well, then they just don't read, so that's not <laughs> spread the word, Alan. Spread the word, yeah. <laughs> Michael Kraft. Who would? What would one book? If you wanted them to get to know what kind of writer you are, and you were, and they said, "Well, give me one of your books, and I'll read it." Which one would you give them? Without hesitation, I would say Inside Dumont. It's my collection of short stories. Um, it it has something for everyone. Uh, they're they're all very different, and uh, doing a collection of short stories like that uh, gave me as a writer the chance to really flex my writerly muscles in terms of, of technique. I mean, some of the stories are first person, some of them are third, some are past tense, some are present. Um, some, some are very linear in their plot construction and others are not. Um, it, it's, it's, uh, for, for I, I loved writing it. I love how it turned out. And I think it's, it's a very, digestible work for someone who doesn't know me, um, you know, to see what I'm capable of. Uh, if, if you don't like story number one, you might like story number two. And you may love story number eight. Who knows? But uh, it's a really, really good sampler of how Michael Kraft writes. With 18 published novels and multiple short stories, have, have you noticed any motifs, any recurrent themes in your work, and do you feel that's come out uh, deliberately or, or unconsciously uh, through, through your writing? Well, uh, that's a good question, David. I mean, and I go back to the earlier one um, where, where I said, think for yourself. I mean, that that's a theme that I always promote, whether at the surface or, I mean, it's just, it's so much a part of me. I think that comes through in all the writing. Beyond that, I'm not so sure because, I mean, I most of what I've written has been generally in the mystery genre, um, but not all of it. Uh, I like the I like the discipline and the structure of of a mystery novel, and I would try to bring that to anything I write, um, and it reflects who I am in in the sense that I'm a, a very organized, ordered person. I've said, I've said before, that's, that's just how I tick. Um, you know, some people can't stand that. And, you know, and that's, that's life. You know, people differ. Um, but uh, beyond that, I'm not sure how to answer your question. Yeah, um, you know, uh, J.D. Hone, who's been on the show, and, and, and I know him, um, his write-up said that it's high camp and... Um, I wonder if you find yourself having to be very careful on where you place your comedy and how you place it. Um, I, I find that the placement of the comedy, the humor, uh, is entirely unplanned. I mean, it just strikes me as I'm writing it. Um, there, there are there are times when. You know, <laughs> 
Well, I just know in my gut that, okay, we're, we're sliding into something a little campy here. And, uh, you know, if it works for me in the writing, I assume it's going to work for the reader in the reading. Um, I, I think it's, I think it's impossible to plan that. Now, you know, people who make a, a study of comedy and devote their life to it will probably disagree with that. You know, maybe there is a science to it. If there is, I don't know it. Um, I, I just give it a shot. <laughs> yeah. well, do you feel you need uh, comedic timing? Uh, kind, of, kind of like a stand-up comedian when, when you're, when you're uh, putting humor into, uh, into prose? Absolutely. That sense of comedic timing affects not only dialogue, which would be obvious, you know, how lines are delivered, but, but also the narrative, the, the, the narrative prose. Um, it's, you know, and I'd, I'd be at a loss to tell you exactly what those rules are, but I, I think I've developed a sense of them. Um, I've been uh, an avid amateur actor since high school. I've, I've done a lot of plays. I've written a few play scripts. And along the way, I've, I've done quite a bit of comedy that is scripted for me. And I have often found that that experience, you know, being forced to memorize lines and rehearse it and try to get, trying to get the best, the, the best laugh you can out of a scene really has it has has taught me how to write that kind of material just because I'm used to it in a very, you know, enforced, learned way. And by the same token, that theatrical background, having appeared in plays, taught me the essence of plotting. Uh, and and as a, as I've said, I tend to be a plotter. Uh, as as a novelist, I don't tend to be. I I'm you know absolutely a plotter as a novelist, and I have. A, a, a very keen sense of the structure of the story, uh, you know, before I ever begin writing it. Um, I, I hate to say that I've formalized um, the, the ebb and flow of a murder mystery, but I think uh, to an extent I have. I, I know how part one of any of my novels is going to end. I know how part two is going to end. And I know that by the end of part three, it will be resolved. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a fairly straightforward three-act structure. And it's no accident that people refer to that as a three-act structure. It comes from plays. <laughs> Do you worry about um, political correctness or being how you place things and say things during the story? I try to place things and say things as the characters would would say things. And especially uh, writing in the first person, you know, you, you're, always, you're always hearing that character think. Um, so it's not always politically correct. It's not always current. But I think it's easily justified as being you know, the genuine and real utterance of how a person would actually think or talk. And, and again, in a first-person novel, even the narrative is, is coming from some one person's head. The narrative is, you know, a stream of consciousness thing from, from a character. But when you're hearing that voice, do they tell you how to drive and where to go, and they tell you to do weird things, too? <laughs> <laughs> Just, I'm not sure I understand that question. <laughs> That's what happens to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just seeing how far these voices take take you. Um, actually, um, let's talk about your contact information. So now, do you have a website, and what social media do you like to interact on with readers? Uh, the only uh, the only social medium that I'm involved with is Facebook. Um, I have. I have a very active page there, uh, so if you search for Michael Craft with a C, you'll probably find it, though there certainly are other Michael Crafts. But the easier way to get to that uh, is to go to my website, michaelcraft.com. That website's been around for over 
20 years when it was really easy to get michaelcraft.com. You know, I mean, <laughs> now you, have to, you would have to do michaelcrafttheriter.com or something like that, but michaelcraft.com. Wow. Uh, and on the contact page, uh, there is a link to my Facebook page, um, and there are all the handy buying links uh, for the new novel, Desert Getaway, the first Dante and Jazz Mystery. It's published by Brash Books. And I'm, I'm so proud uh, to have landed with Brash. Uh, I'm working directly with Lee Goldberg, who is one of its co-founders and publishers. He acted, he acted directly as editor of this project. So here, you know, here I am working with a number one New York Times best-selling author, you know, kind of tweaking my work. Uh, and uh, you know, and it has his imprimatur on it. So, I mean, I'm just delighted with how this has evolved. Um, I I also, I also owe a big note of thanks Lee Goldberg's brother Todd Goldberg, uh, who is uh, director of the Master of Fine Arts program in creative writing and screenwriting for UC Riverside, which is a low residency program that actually meets here in the desert. Um, that is not the program I attended, but I came to know Todd just because we're both writers living in the same valley. And he was, he was the person, I mentioned this earlier, who uh, recommended to Akashic Books that I be approached uh, to write that noir story for Palm Springs Noir. So Todd, Bol Todd Goldberg and uh, Lee Goldberg, big friends of mine now, and <laughs> I'm happy to uh, share any of the glory for this book with them. Now, of course, we'll have that up on our website, the book, your website, so people can find it with one click and get right to the link and all that. Mm -hmm. So um, so what's what? any good secrets about Todd Goldberg? He's on next week. I want to know if there's any gossip. <laughs> You know. Well, you will have no trouble whatever getting a good story out of him. Yeah. I mean, he had, <laughs> I, I went to an appearance that he made uh, at a local library just last week, and I'm telling you, you know, just put a nickel in him, and he'll do, like, his own stand-up for an hour, you know, with, 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 without a flub or a flaw, and it's all very interesting. Uh, he, his, his mother was a, a, a highly colorful character uh, living here in the valley and he has a lot of stories to share about her and his own bringing up and uh, yeah you'll if you have not yet talked to Todd no. you will I know you me. Will I've known me for years and we've had a lot of good conversations and he's hilarious ah. too and even yes. Burl Burl Bear is uncle like their uncle hey, he's ah. he's another hilarious <laughs> guy uh, he, he was on radio in Seattle and he's he writes true crime so um, yeah, it's quite the family. But I was just hoping for a little bit of gossip, but that's okay. No, I, oh, no, 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 no. I, I, I'm no better than that. Oh, you know? Come on, you didn't see him in a dress going to the Trader Joe's or something? Come on, we need something. I was <laughs> always trying to get people in trouble. I'm, I'm always stirring a little bit of stuff, getting a little bit of smiling. That's your job, that's but this job. is mine. So. Get some laughs here. Uh, come on, that's what I do. <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure. We've really appreciated you being here and uh, really look forward to uh, talking to you again. And so now the book we're talking about is Desert Getaway. It's a must-buy. You've got to keep Michael in the lap of luxury that he's in. So you've got to get out there and buy it. We don't. He, he can't go back to work at the drive-thru. So oh. our guest, Michael Kraft, thank you for being here. Thank you, Alan. It's truly been a pleasure and good talking to you, Don, and David as well. Thanks, Michael. Thank you, Michael. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.